Yes. So when we're talking about work that we've uh, developed over the past few years to do rapid parameter estimation while maintaining accuracy, uh, there have been a number of collaborators involved, but the two most important people are Stephen Green, who's a postdoc at the AI, uh, and Max Dax, who's a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Tübingen. Um, Stephen came to the last uh, workshop in this um, IPAM series. So those of you who were at, uh, at that workshop as well will have heard um, some of this before. And I've tried to put a few um, different things in my talk. Uh, so they'll hopefully be something for everyone. Okay, so uh, the plan for my talk, I'll start with a brief um, overview of current and future gradation wave detectors uh, and describe the paradigm we use for gravitational wave parameter estimation. That should be familiar to most people in this room. Um, and then I'll talk about fast and accurate parameter estimation methods. Uh, I'll briefly mention reduced order quadrature uh, and the use of um, machine learning techniques to accelerate waveform model evaluation. But I'll focus most of my time on uh, the work we've been doing on neural posterior estimation. Uh, and then at the end, I'll highlight some of the challenges that we will face to uh, extend these methods to uh, problems we, that we'll encounter in future detectors. Okay, so as everybody is aware, gradational wave astronomy has exploded as a new field in the last uh, few years. And this has come about because of the construction of a network of ground-based interferometers. Now, there are currently four active interferometers, the two LIGO detectors in the US, Virgo in Italy, and CAGRA in Japan. Um, a LIGO has collected uh, approximately 20 months of data so far, spread over three separate observing runs. Uh, and in this data, we found um, 90 sources that are thought to be most likely astrophysical. The vast majority of these are mergers of binary black holes. There are a couple of binary neutron star events uh, and also a few um, events that are most likely neutron star black hole binaries. Um, so LIGO is not the end of gravitational wave astronomy, it's only the beginning, and there are already plans for a number of uh, future instruments. Um, the most advanced of uh, these is, uh, in terms of planning, is LISA which is a space-based interferometer that is due to launch in the mid 2030s. Um, by going into space, you can get away from seismic noise, which is what limits the sensitivity of ground-based detectors at low frequency. And you can also make your detectors much bigger. And so this allows you to access uh, the millihertz gravitational wave band, and that's what LISA will be targeting. In the millihertz band, you're sent you see uh, much more massive sources, typically containing supermassive black holes uh, that we observe in the centers of galaxies. So LISA will be an ESA-led uh, mission, but NASA will have a significant uh, involvement both on the hardware and data analysis side. Um, and it, it, this uh, involvement of NASA was recently endorsed strongly in the decadal survey. There are also plans for detectors to come after LIGO and Virgo uh, and CAGRA on the ground. Uh, these are generally referred to as 3G detectors, third generation, um, reflecting the fact that the current LIGO detector uh, is the second generation of the LIGO instruments. Um, there are a number of concepts that are being discussed, um, including the Einstein telescope, which is a European project, and Cosmic Explorer in the US. The main goal for these third generation detectors is to increase uh, sensitivity um, by about an order of magnitude, and that gives you therefore um, about a factor of a thousand increase in sensitive volume, uh, but also to expand the bandwidth of detectors by pushing the sensitivity down to lower frequencies uh, and possibly also to higher frequencies, and that lower frequency push uh, will allow you to observe systems for longer and also systems with higher masses uh, than um, the current detectors. So these 3G detectors could start operation in the 2030s. It depends very much on when uh, and at what level funding uh, for constructing the infrastructure um, starts, uh, but there's a good chance they will be operating contemporaneously with um, LISA. 
Okay, so all of these gravitational wave detectors produce data um, and that data contains sources. Uh, and when we detect sources, we want to learn, do science with them. And to do science, we need to um, infer their parameters. So the paradigm that is used for this parameter estimation um, process for all types of gravitational wave detector uh, is uh, a Bayesian one. Um, as you are all, all know, what we do in Bayesian inference is um, use uh, observed data to update our prior information um, about the properties of a particular system, uh, which is characterized by a, a distribution of the parameter values for that system, P of theta. Um, we update that into a posterior distribution, which is you know, the revised information we have about the parameters after taking the data. And the way you do that updating uh, is by using the likelihood um, which is the probability that you would see the data you've seen uh, given um, some particular parameter values. So this um, updating process is encapsulated in Bayes' theorem, which is the top equation on this slide. P of theta given d on the left-hand side is the posterior, and that's related to P of d given theta, the likelihood, uh, and P of theta, the prior. Um, and then there's this normalization P of d, which is the evidence. Um, that's basically an integral of the numerator uh, over all parameter choices. Um, so if we're going to do Bayesian inference, you need to specify a prior. That's typically uh, straightforward, although when you do population inference, uh, that prior itself depends on parameters, which you then want to learn from combining observations of many different types of event. Um, but the, yeah, the thing that is typically uh, more complicated to represent is the likelihood. Um, now, the way we, so the likelihood, yeah, is a probabilistic model for the output of your detector. And what we typically assume is that what is coming out of our detector is a linear combination of um, some signal, h of uh, t, given the, which depends on the parameters that we want to know, uh, theta, um, plus some additive noise. And so we write uh, the detector output s as n plus h. Uh, the Waveform h of t is typically assumed to be known precisely once you've specified the parameters. That's uh, just an approximation because our waveform models are not perfect, but they're pretty good. Um, and so when you write down the likelihood, you're really writing down a statement about the, the noise component. Um, and so you want to write down a probability distribution for n, which is equal to d minus h. And we normally assume that that noise is almost a Gaussian distribution um, and is stationary. And that means that um, the noise at different frequencies is independent. Um, with those assumptions, then the likelihood uh, takes the form that's shown in the bottom equation. Um, the only thing you need to specify is the variance in the noise at each frequency, which is uh, characterized by the power spectral density. And that's this quantity SH of F that appears in the denominator of the integral um, at the bottom right here. Okay, so that's the, the basic paradigm. Um, and then to do inference, what we want to do is characterize this posterior probability distribution. To characterize the posterior probability distribution, we usually draw samples from it. And we draw samples using uh, stochastic methods such as Markov chain Monte Carlo. But doing this, we typically need to draw millions of samples. Um, so we need to evaluate the likelihood that appears uh, in Bayes' theorem uh, millions of times. And the likelihood depends on this waveform model h of t. Um, and so every likelihood evaluation involves calculating an expensive waveform model. Um, and so when you're doing millions of these, it can become computationally very intensive. So as an example of that, uh, the first event, GW 150914, um, was observed uh, in the middle of September 2015 and was finally published in mid-February 2016. Um, and that the anal analysis of GW 1509.14 used 50 million CPU hours. So that's 20,000 computers running continuously for 100 days. Uh, now, not all of this cost was for parameter estimation. Quite a lot of the cost was um, dedicated to estimating significance. It was the first event. So we wanted to be absolutely sure we could state how confident we were that it was a real astrophysical source and not just a random fluctuation in the detectors. Um, but a significant fraction of this 50 million CPU hours did go on parameter estimation. Uh, the, there's typically always a lag between when LIGO uh, and Virgo collect data and when they publish um, 
uh, the analysis of that data, both for exceptional events, these are uh, events that are unlike things that have seen before uh, and deserve their own papers, uh, but also the catalogs. Um, and a lot of the reason for the lag there is between observation and publication is uh, the need to do parameter estimation, um, typically uh, more than once, um, using different wave models, using different uh, calibration of the detector data, and so forth. So parameter estimation is a big cost um, of current detectors, and this is only going to get worse as we move into the future. At the moment, LIGO and Virgo are detecting about one event per week, uh, but this is going to increase to as many as several per day um, when we reach design sensitivity. And then when we go to future detectors, they're going to have wider bandwidths. Um, as I mentioned, one of the main targets for the uh, 3G detectors is to have more um, sensitivity at lower frequencies. That means you can uh, sources come into band earlier and you can observe them for longer. So a longer waveform needs greater uh, computational time, both to construct and to calculate the likelihood. And so the parameter estimation uh, becomes more expensive. Sources for LISA, space-based detector, um, and to a lesser extent, but still some extent, 3G detectors will also overlap in time and frequency. And that requires additional complexity, uh, the need to um, fit parameters for more than one signal simultaneously. Um, so we can't continue as we are. If we continue as we are, then well, we're going to be computationally limited and we won't be able to handle all of this data. And we really want to um, characterize all these sources because that's the way we all do uh, interesting science. We also want to do multi-messenger science. This workshop is all about multi-messenger. Um, and if you're going to do multi-messenger with gravitational wave sources, you want to be able to send out triggers to for EM follow-up as quickly as you can. Uh, that is done now, and I'm going to say in a minute um, the methods that are used to do that. Uh, but it's clear that in the future, um, what we might expect to see is uh, some uh, trends between the properties of sources and whether or not they have the M counterparts. Um, those properties are likely to depend on things more than uh, where the source is in the sky. It'll depend on masses. Um, spins and so on. And so if you can do parameter estimation uh, more quickly, you might also be able to classify the probability that an event has EM, uh, an EM counterpart uh, more accurately as well. And that can only be a good thing because with uh, you know, several events per day, you want to know which ones you should really be spending your telescope time on to follow up. So these are all reasons why uh, we want to be able to do parameter estimation uh, quicker. Um, and there are a number of techniques that are being explored. Um, in the context of multi-messenger, there is uh, an algorithm called Baystar, which is currently used within LIGO to generate um, triggers uh, when a LIGO sees events. Um, so during the last observing run, these triggers were all released publicly, um, and the trigger uh, typically gave the time of the event um, and some information, the most important of which for doing EM follow-up is where the source is on the sky. Uh, so these sky maps were typically produced using Bayesstar. Um, so this is a Bayesian algorithm which is based on approximations to the likelihood. The information that we have about where a source is uh, on the sky comes from the relative time of arrival of the source in the various detectors in the network. So it's really a triangulation question. Um, and because the information is mostly coming from that triangulation, you can um, get away with making approximations uh, about the other properties of the signal, so the masses and, and so on. Um, so I have not worked directly on based on myself. Um, so don't ask me detailed questions about it, but the basic idea is that um, it uses an approximate likelihood I call the autocorrelation likelihood, which is evaluated at um, a maximum likelihood estimate of the parameter values. It rapidly uh, marginalizes over parameters other than sky location uh, using um, approximations uh, and lookup tables. Um, and then uh, you end up with this marginalized autocorrelation likelihood, which is a function of sky location, uh, and that is translated into a sky map. Um, which gives you the probability density of the source location on the sky. Um, so this yeah, 
it's a very uh, good algorithm. Uh, it works well, um, and the sky maps are reliable when they are compared to uh, sky maps that are generated by um, you know, full Bayesian techniques. But it doesn't make approximations, and so necessarily is not as accurate as uh, it could be. So if you can do this better, then yeah, it's going to be uh, valuable. Uh, another way you can attempt to do parameter estimation faster is to use standard techniques that make the cost of evaluating a likelihood lower. Um, and the dominant cost of evaluating likelihoods is calculating waveforms. Um, so one uh, other approach that can be taken to accelerate parameter estimation is to make waveform model evaluation quicker. Um, so there was a talk about this, uh, I think, two days ago by uh, Leila. Eagle. Um, so I'm not going to say much about this, uh, but you know, there are various uh, approaches being taken using uh, different types of machine learning methods um, to build uh, fast waveform um, generation codes. Uh, an example of this is Gaussian process regression. Um, this was uh, used not so much um, to, because it's fast. I mean, the model is faster than the new record relativity simulations that were input to it. Uh, but because it gives you um, uh, an estimate of the uncertainty in your model, uh, as well as uh, a best guess of the model itself. And so you can um, both marginalize over your modeling uncertainties directly uh, and evaluate your likelihood uh, more quickly using models like this. Um, so I think accelerating waveform models uh, using whatever, um, whatever technique uh, is most effective um, is a, a good way to make PE faster. Um, but uh, yeah, you can also uh, do even better. Uh, another approach that um, has proven to be quite successful is using reduced order modeling. Um, so again, this is a method that is designed to make conventional techniques faster. All you do is make the cost of evaluating a likelihood lower, um, but then you do all the sampling using standard um, stochastic techniques based on Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, so reduced order modeling works because it was a, realized in the uh, early 2010s that uh, gravitational wave parameter spaces, so waveform model spaces, are much simpler than you naively, uh, they naively appear. Um, and that means that uh, a 15-dimensional parameter space of possible waveform signals can actually be represented by a relatively small number of basis waveforms. So it's possible to produce a reduced basis, um, which describes the full waveform space. Uh, so the way this is used is you first find the, the reduced basis representation of the waveforms. Then you need a quick way to represent um, an arbitrary waveform on that basis, um, and then a quick way to evaluate the likelihood. Um, so uh, the approach that's taken is to um, require your target waveform to match your basis at certain uh, frequencies. Um, so rather than uh, projecting the waveform onto the basis by taking overlaps, which would not save you any computational cost, you interpolate the waveform um, through its value at uh, a small at a number of frequencies equal to the size of the basis. And that allows you to replace the likelihood calculation, which involves an overlap between your uh, waveform and the data uh, by a quadrature sum. So you end up just summing uh, weights times the value of the waveform uh, at the particular frequencies where you are interpolating it. To use this, you then have to be able to evaluate your waveform quickly at those frequencies. For certain waveform models, that's uh, easy because they're already interacting in the frequency domain. Uh, but for others, this is uh, for time domain models in particular, um, this is achieved by uh, interpolating the waveform at those frequencies across um, parameter space. And that leads to things that are called surrogate models. So the two uh, triangle plots you see on the right hand side of this screen, uh, the upper plot is um, the, represents the one and 2D probability distributions uh, for uh, a particular source. Uh, calculated using uh, full likelihood. Um, and the bottom is the same uh, data analyzed using this reduced order quadrature approach. As you can see that by eye, these look uh, basically the same. And that 
um, demonstrates the method is working. Um, so ROQ likelihoods are um, cutting edge in the sense that they are used in many current LIGO analyses um, and we rely on them to do the PE fast enough, uh, but the extension to the other waveform models and also sort of, uh, systems such as LISA, which have much longer waveforms, um, is non-trivial. Okay, so, so far I've mentioned techniques that uh, make standard methods faster, but can you do something completely different? Um, and this is, uh, you know, the answer is yes, and this is what we've been working on in the last few years, um, is developing uh, methods that uh, use machine learning techniques to directly construct posterior distributions uh, given input data. So if the goal is to build a neural network that takes as input the uh, observed data, and as output, it generates samples from the posterior distribution on the parameters. Um, so yeah, the way you do this is by constructing a neural network to produce a distribution, uh, and then you train the neural network um, to so that the, the distribution the network represents is as close as possible to the parameter posterior distribution. Um, this is achieved by uh, minimizing a loss function. Um, the neural network depends on a large number of parameters, which you gradually adjust uh, in order to minimize the loss. Uh, and the loss function that uh, we minimize is the cross entropy with the true distribution. Um, so the cross entropy is the expectation value over a probability distribution or minus the log of the other probability distribution. Uh, the minimum this can uh, possibly have is when uh, the two distributions coincide. And so we um, take that uh, cross entropy and we uh, compute its expectation value over all possible realizations of the data because we want this um, technique to uh, be good on average, uh, regardless of what input data we give it. Um, and so that defines this loss function, uh, which is the first equality uh, in this equation in the middle of the slide. Now, Bayes' theorem tells us that the uh, probability distribution um, you get by multiplying P of D by P of theta given D, uh, which is the probability of um, the joint event theta and D, uh, is equal to the probability distribution you get from multiplying P of theta by P of D given theta. So that means that this cross entropy um, can be rewritten uh, in the form of the right hand equation which is now an expectation over the prior of an expectation over the likelihood uh, of uh, minus log of q. Um, and that observation allows you to uh, do this training in an efficient way that doesn't involve ever calculating the likelihood. Um, it just does it by simulation. So uh, what you do is simulate a bunch of samples from your prior. For each of those samples, you simulate data by adding a realization of the noise uh, drawn from your likelihood model. Um, and then you calculate the average loss over these samples. Uh, and then you gradually adjust the network parameters in order to minimize this loss. So this procedure is appealing because uh, you never have to evaluate the likelihood. You only have to simulate from it. And that is typically much easier. Um, you amortize the cost of waveform generation because the need to generate waveforms is all uh, in this training process where you're simulating uh, data um, for different parameter values drawn from your prior. So you do have to evaluate waveforms. You have to evaluate enough of them that you can learn this distribution, but that only has to be done once um, before you collect any data. And then you can uh, you uh, put all that cost up front. Um, and then no matter how many events you observe of the observing run, you can do um, you can use the network to do parameter estimation very quickly. Um, the other appealing thing about this approach is that it is flexible. And then the way that you do uh, your inference based on simulation, um, there's flexibility there because you can change easily the waveform model, the noise model, uh, and so on. Um, and it's often easier than uh, changing the likelihood in a standard method. Okay, so this is what we want to do. We're going to build a neural network that um, represents a probability distribution, and then we want to tune the network so that probability distribution is you know, has minimal cross entropy with the target distribution. Um, but neural networks are not fundamentally um, 
probabilistic. They were originally uh, envisaged as uh, representations of um, mappings uh, or complex functions. Um, and so you know, the way you use a neural network to generate samples from a probability distribution um, is to uh, use it to construct a mapping from a simple distribution that you can readily sample from uh, to uh, the target distribution. Um, so there are a number of different ways that you uh, can do this. Uh, we experimented with a few of them, but the one that appears to, um, well, the one that is working uh, for the cases we've considered so far, uh, and it seems to have a great deal of uh, flexibility, um, is the uh, notion of a normalizing flow. Um, so a normalizing flow uh, is a mapping from a multivariate, from a product of normal distributions um, onto your target distribution. Um, and the law of conservation of probability says that if you, uh, you're constructing a mapping FD of theta to take you, your parameters from your normal distribution uh, to your target distribution, then the target distribution it has a density that is given by this uh, one at the, uh, in, in the equation on this slide. So if you can construct a normalizing flow, uh, that has an invert that is invertible. And so you can compute this inverse you need in order to construct Q of theta given D, uh, and also has a relatively simple Jacobian for the transformation between the two sets of variables. Um, then um, it's a, a useful tool because by drawing samples from a normal distribution and applying this uh, transformation, you can get samples from your target distribution. Um, and so normalizing flows are um, neural networks that um, you know, construct these functions f of d uh, that encode these mappings. And it's possible to construct relatively complicated uh, functions um, by building them up from a sequence of uh, simpler transformations, um, which are called coupling transforms. Um, so in a coupling transform at each layer of the neural network, you change uh, only half of the parameters. Um, the one half of the parameters are left fixed, the other half of the parameters undergo a transformation, um, and you have some freedom over what form that transformation takes. Uh, what we have been um, using is uh, spline flows. These are described in a paper by Durkin et al. from 2019. Um, and the individual um, elements of the coupling transform are taken to be rational quadratic splines. So these uh, are quadratic splines that interpolate between um, knots. Uh, and the tunable parameters of the flow are the weights um, and locations of those lots, knots. So by using a sufficiently long sequence of coupling transforms, you can represent uh, quite complicated functions. Uh, Durkin et al. show how normalizing flows can be used um, to transform uh, simple geometric um, shapes into images of um, faces. Um, in our case, uh, we yeah, found that you can use normalizing flows to map uh, posterior distributions of gravitational wave events uh, into normal distributions. Okay, so there are a few refinements uh, to this overall picture. Um, one is uh, to use compression um, on the input data. So um, I mentioned reduced bases earlier. The reason that these work uh, as a tool for accelerating standard inference um, is the fact that uh, we have found waveform, gradation waveform bases can be uh, compressed. So model spaces can be represented by a small, much smaller number uh, of basis waveforms. Um, so you could impose that by hand. You could uh, project your input data and your weight input waveforms uh, in training onto um, a fixed reduced basis that you construct in some other way, uh, but it's obviously more satisfying and uh, robust to do this using uh, the same network architecture. Um, and so we achieve this using uh, an embedding network, um, which has two phases. First of all, you take the input data and project it and do a linear projection of it. Um, and the, uh, we include inductive bias in that linear projection network uh, by seeding it with principal components of noise free waveforms. So the idea here is that uh, we expect that the components of the data that are most important 
for the network to use uh, are the ones that um, are signal-like. Uh, and so if you take a large set of signals, you do a principal component analysis of those signals, um, it tells you what you know, signal-like things look like. Um, and so we use those as uh, the starting point um, for the, this linear projection training. Um, it just makes it the procedure faster. Uh, we don't stop at linear projection. We then have a nonlinear network at the end, um, which gives a little bit of extra uh, compression. Um, so we're able to compress the input uh, space, which is um, in debt, so the number of detectors times 24,000 uh, dimensions uh, to an output dimension, which is um, just 128. Uh, the other thing that we um, have used is a technique called group equivariant um, neural posterior estimation. Uh, the reason that this uh, became necessary was um, an observation that uh, representing one of the parameters that characterize a waveform model, specifically the time of coalescence, requires a great deal of um, reduced basis elements and uses up a great deal of the flexibility in the network uh, if that is one of the parameters that you're trying to fit. Um, so this is illustrated in, illustrated in the figure here. Uh, what is shown in each of these plots is the representation error uh, of a random, you know, randomly chosen waveform um, as a function of the number of uh, basis elements that are included in the reduced basis. Um, in the middle, you'll see what happens if we uh, align all of our training waveforms so that the coalescence, coalescence is at a known time, t equals zero. Um, and then as you move outwards, uh, we're allowing the, uh, the waveforms to be shifted with respect to one another uh, by an increasing amount. Um, so we'll see, we see that whereas uh, if all the waveforms were aligned at t equals zero, you only need, a, you need less than 100 elements in the waveform basis uh, as you uh, allow for greater and greater uncertainty in that um, coalescence time, uh, you need more and more basis elements. So we found that this was very limiting uh, in the performance of the network, um, but it's kind of frustrating because um, the transformation you need to do to shift your coalescence time is trivial. Um, you, if you knew what the coalescence time was in one detector, all you need to do is shift the detector data by that amount and suddenly to the template, um, and then you'd have aligned everything with a uh, time shift of zero. Um, so if the time shift was known, you could do this, um, and it would significantly simplify the learning process. But of course, we don't know that uh, a, pro a priori. Um, and when you're talking about a detector network, each detector has a slightly different uh, coalescence time, um, which uh, is how we work out what direction the source is coming from on the sky. Um, and so this uh, time symmetry is uh, not an exact symmetry for um, the whole network but just individual detectors. Um, but we did find that it was possible uh, to you know, do something with this observation. Um, and the, what we did was include an extra variable in an extra parameter in the parameter space, uh, which is um, a blurred estimate of uh, the time of coalescence. So the idea here is that you know, in principle, we do, we analyze the data, we get some information about time of coalescence, uh, but it's not perfect. Um, but what we can do is use that information that we've uh, derived from the data uh, to gradually improve the time of coalescence estimate. Um, so uh, we introduced this extra parameter, which is a blurry estimate of the true time of coalescence. Um, and we follow a, a Gibbs sampling procedure where we uh, sequentially um, you know, uh, draw, uh, we, we sequentially infer our parameters from um, uh, the uh, network that is uh, given input data that is shifted by this blurred estimate of time of coalescence. Uh, and then we resample the blurred estimate of time of coalescence from a fixed um, blurry distribution, a fixed kernel um, that is conditioned on the uh, most recently um, estimated value of the true time of coalescence that came from um, the network. 
Okay, so this process converges in about 10 iterations. Uh, the blurriness is needed because you will never get exactly the right time of coalescence. Um, and it also helps the network to move in the, the right direction uh, when you start with a quite poor estimate of time of coalescence. Um, so this works well, um, and you know, it's basically uh, you know, what it demonstrates is that by exploiting symmetries or near symmetries, um, you can simplify your learning task uh, and make um, things work much more efficiently. Okay, so I've talked about most of the elements um, of the neural posterior estimation network. The one thing I haven't talked talked about yet is the spectral density. Um, so if you recall, in the likelihood, uh, I said that we typically assume that the data coming out of a detector follows a Gaussian distribution uh, with uh, a spectral, uh, with a variance that's characterized by a spectral density. If we knew that spectral density exactly, then uh, it would be no problem. Um, in standard inference, we would uh, use that known PSD to construct our posterior. In neural posterior estimation, we would just use that known PSD when we were generating training data. Uh, in practice, we don't know the PSD and it's not uh, stationary um, over long time scales. Um, over the course of an observing run, it will fluctuate a bit. Um, and so you need to account for that. So one way that could be done is just uh, as part of the training data, you uh, draw samples from different PSDs. Uh, what that would mean is that the um, output Posteriors will be somewhat broader because they'd be uh, accounting for um, the uh, variations in the PSD over the observing run, uh, rather than um, using the information about the PSD at the time of the event. We do have information about the PSD at the time of the event that's obtained by analyzing nearby data. Um, and so uh, the um, standard parameter estimation runs use this estimated PSD from off-source data uh, in constructing the posterior distribution. Um, so we can do something similar with the NPE network by including the power spectral density that is used to generate the specific training data uh, as context information that we uh, provide as input to the network. Um, and you know, this was the, the uh, the big step that we took in our most recent paper was to include this uh, and allow for this PSD variation. And so this really is um, full amortization because we uh, now have something that can account for the fact that the PSD of each event uh, is different. Okay, so um, Okay, so we build a network in this way, uh, and then we need to check that it works. Um, and there are two different types of validation we uh, can do and have done. Uh, one type of validation is to check for internal consistency. So this means if we generate, um, if we either take some of our training data or we generate new samples uh, in the same way that we generated our training data uh, and construct PP plots, uh, which is the probability at which the true parameters lie uh, so it's the cumulative distribution of the probability uh, at which the true parameters um, uh, lie. Uh, that should be a diagonal line if everything is working properly. Um, this example on the right hand side is based on a thousand uh, simulated uh, data sets. Um, and uh, as you can see, all of the parameters lie pretty close to diagonal line. The numbers in brackets next to each parameter uh, label are the p-values um, asking for uh, how significant the line uh, differs from uh, a diagonal line. Uh, so not, you know, there are a couple of parameters that have oh, p-values close to uh, one or five percent, uh, but in the most cases um, there is no evidence that we are not uh, recovering um, posteriors that are completely consistent with the input distribution. Yep. Okay. Uh, I will do my best. Um, okay. So the other thing we want to do is check external consistency. So this uh, is done by actually using this network to analyze real data um, and comparing it to the results of uh, running standard stochastic samplers on real data. Uh, so to, to do that, we reanalyzed all of the events that are in the first uh, 
GW uh, gravitational wave transient catalog. This is all the events that were observed in the first two uh, observing runs. A network that was built for this used 5 million training waveforms using the uh, waveform model called IMR Phenom PV2. Uh, and we trained different networks uh, for different combinations of detectors that were operating uh, during the runs. So this is the result. Uh, this is uh, for GW1509-14. Um, this is at the left-hand side is uh, one and 2D probability distributions for a, a, a subset of the parameters. Um, constructed, uh, the, there are two lines on each of these plots. It's hard to see in some cases because they agree very well. Uh, the blue lines were constructed using uh, standard techniques, low inference, um, which is the standard LIGO uh, inference package. Uh, and then the orange lines show what we obtained with uh, our technique, uh, which we call bingo. Um, and you see that the, the posteriors agree very well. Um, now, a by eye comparison is not enough, but you can also compare. Uh, oops, there was some text on the slide which appears to have disappeared. I uh, apologize for that. Um, what this table shows is the JS divergence, which is uh, the Jensen Shannon divergence. It's a measure of similarity between two distributions. If it's less than two, uh, then the distributions are considered indistinguishable. And you see for vast majority of parameters for most of the events, uh, that is the case. There are a few uh, events where it's, um, the divergences are bigger, um, and these, but these are typically ones that are close to the edges of the prior. Um, and so the, the uh, posterior constructed using standard methods has considerable support outside the ranges over which we had uh, trained our network. So we expect that to improve if we uh, widen the parameter space. Um, so I've been given my out of time warning. Um, so I will not have much time to talk about future challenges. So what I'll do is just mention uh, a few of them. And then if you want me to say a bit more about any of them, you can ask in the questions. Uh, so some of the challenges we're going to face in future detectors relates to uh, having longer waveforms. Um, so with greater low frequency sensitivity, sources are in band for longer. This makes the P uh, challenge greater because you have to uh, use much longer waveforms um, and also much more data uh, in any given analysis. Uh, for ground-based detectors, you'll have events in band for order of a day. For LISA, it will be years. Um, and so we need techniques to uh, handle that. Um, it's not clear that reduced bases will be enough. We might have to do more. Uh, another challenge will be uh, non-stationary noise. Um, this has typically not been a problem for binary black holes, but there, we have had some events already where there have been noise non-stationarities that have overlapped the event. Um, and you need to handle that in your parameter estimation. In principle, this is very easy for uh, simulation-based inference techniques because you can train your network using uh, real noise um, or noise models that include on stationarities. Uh, and so in theory, this is a problem that uh, these techniques are very well suited to address. Uh, another challenge will be in population inference. Um, as we get more and more events, we want to combine them to say something about the underlying population. And this is typically done using Bayesian hierarchical modeling. Um, but uh, we, if, when you're doing that, you're going to be increasingly, well, potentially increasingly sensitive to things that are going on in the tails of your distribution. So on the one hand, neural posterior estimation might be a very powerful tool for this because you can generate lots of samples from your distribution very quickly. And so you can sample the tails. Uh, but you have to trust that you're representing the tails uh, well. And this PP plot at the right-hand side shows what happens if we push our current network to uh, 100,000 realizations of the data. Uh, and we start to see that it, there are significant deviations from diagonality. So we're clearly not, um, we're not there yet in terms of uh, fully representing the tails of the distribution. Uh, and a final challenge that we will have to deal with is overlapping sources. Um, all of this analysis has been uh, based on segments of data that contain at most one event, um, but future detectors will have uh, events that overlap in time and frequency. This will be particularly true for LISA, all of the events are basically present in all of the data, um, but it will also be a problem for third generation ground-based detectors. And so uh, it's not 
completely clear how what the best way to tackle that is, uh, but we're going to need um, new approaches if we're going to do it. Okay, um, so I will stop there. I'll leave my summary up. I'm happy to take some questions. <laughs>